Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. It's going to be a great second day. The sun's even come out for us, so everything's looking up. Um, and fortunately for me, the speaker who was due to be speaking after me decided, uh, couldn't, couldn't come. So they gave me double the slot. So unfortunately for you, you've got to listen to me for twice as long as all the other speakers. But there we are. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two presentations seamlessly linked together. So you won't even know I've gone from one to the other, honestly. I'm going to start off by talking about urban design governance. And here we're really talking about how, uh, how well, the means and the processes of designing the built environment and how the state, typically the state, intervenes in those processes in order to shape both better processes themselves, but also ultimately better outcomes, better design, place quality outcomes. And we've been doing this an awfully long time, since ancient times. Um, the earliest example of this governance of design that I could find in England, where I'm from, is from the 12th century, where the king at that time took the power to control crenellations. You had to get a license to crenellate from the king, because the king didn't want people building castles. Not particularly sophisticated, but probably quite effective. More sophisticated in the 13th century, Siena introduced a whole series of morphological controls to control things like the building line, even the proportions of windows, materials, and so forth. So we've been doing this sort of thing for a long time. We've been engaging in different ways with the quality of places and how we design those places. Today, our motivations for engaging in the governance of design have changed. They're very diverse, very complex. Sometimes they're to do with particular welfare outcomes. Sometimes just simple functional issues. We want the city's spaces to function well. Perhaps there's economic reasons why we engage in design. Sometimes that's to do with how we project ourselves or how we project a city. We want a city to have a certain status, to have a certain image. Sometimes it's about fairness. Different groups in society being able to fairly use the spaces of the city. Protection, protection of heritage is another reason why we might want to engage in design. Different societal and increasingly environmental reasons, and of course aesthetic reasons as well. What places look like is important to us, and that's another reason that we might be motivated to engage in these issues around the quality of place. Despite doing this for an awfully long time, and despite all those motivations, many people argue that certainly since the Second World War, we've tended to build places that not many people love. Some people describe them as placeless. All sorts of different types of places that we, we're building, often on the outskirts of our cities. All these types of places, which for various reasons don't quite work, aren't really quite for people, we don't love them, um, and very often we criticize them, as, as we were hearing yesterday in, in a number of the presentations. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons I would argue for that is because we tend to substitute regulation for design. We create various types of regulations to control, for all those good reasons, all those reasons around welfare and aesthetics and all those reasons, we create lots of regulations controlling things like parking and the width of roads and the types of roads 
different land use controls, density requirements, construction codes, space standards within homes, for lots and lots of good reasons. But for some reason, all of those regulations don't come together to create the sort of places that we wish to see. They tend to be quite limited in their scope. They're very technical in their aspiration. They're generic. They're not based out, they, they don't emerge from a place-based approach to design. They're not about particular sites or particular places. They're generic. They apply to whole cities or even whole countries sometimes. And therefore, they're not specific to particular places that we're trying to create. In that sense, these types of tools can be quite crude. And we see them written into the fabric of cities around the world. Some of the best examples of these are in Japan. These are, these are all images from, from, uh, from Japanese cities. And there you most starkly see this impact of regulation on the physical form of the city. So if you look across the city, you can see the arterial roads and how along the arterial roads buildings suddenly shoot up because the zoning ordinances allow on those major arterial roads, buildings to be built higher. You see, because of concerns about shadow lines, you see buildings stepping back from the street in these rather strange shaped buildings. You see, because of building construction codes and the, and the, and the major concern around fire, that a lot of buildings have this funny little gap between them, almost too small to get down, big enough for a cat to go down, but not big enough for a person these funny little gaps, and that's to do with regulation, it's to do with the fire code, effectively. So you can see the way we regulate cities written into the structure, the physical structure of cities. And yet, for those of you who have been to Japan, you'll know that many of Japan's cities are some of the most vibrant, most fascinating uh, cities and places in the world. So what we mean by good quality is not necessarily easy to define. How do we define quality? Well, we don't just mean aesthetic factors. We're not just here talking about what places look like. There's a whole other range of reasons why we might, or, or other factors that feature in what we might think as good design. It needs to look great, yes, but it also needs to be comfortable. It needs, to, it needs to engage us as human beings. It needs to be safe. Places need to be social. They need to work efficiently. They need to be sustainable. And there are lots of other factors that play into whether a place is of good quality or not and whether we can make that judgment. So we have a conundrum, a design governance conundrum. Can state intervention in the processes of design in the built environment positively shape design processes and outcomes? And if so, how can we go about doing that? That's really been the subject, I suppose, of, of my research life, my, my sort of fascination with this subject is, is around this question. And here, we're not talking about the architect or the designer designing a building. That's a very direct relationship between the designer and a piece of development. What we're really talking about is that decision-making environment within which the architect or the developer operates, but also that decision-making environment within which the city or the state operates and defines its aspirations around design. So design governance, which is typically the role of the state, although not exclusively, design governance is about shaping that decision-making environment within which we negotiate and we discuss and eventually we decide how we are going to design 
the built environment. And in that respect, it's, it's quite intangible in many respects. It's not a tangible thing. It's not a single building that we are designing and, and for a site like an architect would. And it involves lots and lots of complex interests in that decision-making environment, sometimes with ideas and motivations that cut across each other. And so it's a, a very complex thing. Now, in this space, in this decision-making environment, there are lots of tools that we can use to help us in making those decisions. And here we're talking about the means rather than the ends of government. So it's the means of shaping that decision-making process rather than a particular end, particular outcome, a, a particular building or space that we're talking about. And these types of tools come in various varieties, but there's two fundamental categories, I would say. One is the sort of formal tools that we might have, and these are generally required. You have to go through the formal processes of regulation to get your building built, and so you have to meet those requirements within that formal process. But then there's a whole set of informal tools that we can also use. Generally, those are more optional. We don't have to use them. Very often, they're not used. Often, we rely on the formal regulatory processes. And we forget there's a whole set of other tools that we can use as the state or sometimes private or third party interests to define this decision-making environment. So what are these different types of tools? Well, in the UK, about five years ago, I finished quite a, a large project where we were looking at an organization called CABE, which stands for, or used to stand for, the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment. And this is an organization that existed for about 10 years. It was, def it was created by the government at the time in 1999. They were around for 10, to, uh, 11 years. And they used a whole series of tools to try and influence the quality of design in England. They, their responsibility was only for England. And they largely used informal tools. And, and this piece of research was looking back at that period and trying to understand which of these tools had been effective over that period. Because in 2011, with with the austerity cuts, they were wound up. So it was a really interesting experiment for 10 years. All sorts of tools they developed and used. But if we think about the two categories, then those informal tools are largely using what we might call the soft powers of the state, whereas the formal tools are using the hard powers, the hard formal powers of the state and control and so forth. Let's have a little look at what, little bit, oh, the other thing I should mention is, broadly speaking, although it's a little bit crude, we could say that in each of those categories, there's levels of intervention. So the state can intervene in a very concrete, very significant way, or in a much lesser way. And we can, we can classify those tools also according to level of intervention. Let's start with the formal tools very quickly and, and what we might include in, within that formal category of design governance tools. And there's really three categories there going from lesser to greater intervention. And this, as I said, this is the tried and tested approach. This is the approach that you find everywhere. Wherever you are, there's always some form of regulation on the quality of places, even in those places which pretend they don't have any control over design, they do. Places like Houston in the, in the US, which doesn't have a zoning system, but has all sorts of other ordinances put in place to do essentially the same thing, because they found they couldn't get a, away without it. But this is very much the tried and tested approach. And it starts with guidance. And with, there's various forms of guidance. In the UK, we have all of these. 
uh, in different ways, and different places have different types of things. So regulations, in the UK, for example, we have building regulations. There's a building code that you have to meet the, the, the stipulations of. We heard a little bit about that yesterday. Then there's standards, for example, space standards within the home. Many authorities have space standards within the home. Then there are codes. Many sites, particular development sites, have a design code which is applied to them, and that's a set of principles within the boundaries of the site. Then we have policies. Many local authorities produce what we call local plans, and they have policies, and those are quite flexible tools for negotiation around. Sometimes we have parameter plans, which are sort of master plans for, for sites. Guidelines, which are more flexible design guidelines. Uh, uh, often we have, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, the national government produced the National Design Guide, which is a set of 12 principles for the whole of England. Then we have plans, and we even have a type of zoning as well of, of land uses. And different places, different cities, different countries have different combinations of these types of guidance, and they are more or less forceful, depending on how they're adopted and so forth. Then there are types of incentive. And these range from state-aided to state-encouraged. So state-aided uh, may be something like the state providing a piece of infrastructure in a particular part of the city, which then private developers come in and they build around that piece of infrastructure. And it's essentially a form of state aid, in effect, because it helps them to bring that site forward for development. Or state encourage might be something like a zoning bonus. So if you deliver a high quality public realm or a new public space, you can build extra floors on your building. Something like that is state encouraged. And you can use those tools to encourage the delivery of better design. So instead of just saying, we want, a, we want a public space, we say we want a public space of this quality. And if you give us a public space of that quality, you can have extra stories on your building. So these, all these tools can be used in conjunction with aspirations for design. And then ultimately, there's the power of control. The state has the power to say yes or no, to approve something or to reject that development proposal. And that's the ultimate power, if you like. That's what every, every developer wants to be approved and not rejected, or even uh, the state can give itself permission to, do th to build things or, or, or not. Sometimes you have one part of the state giving permission to another bit of the state and, and so forth. So that's the ultimate power within this formal category. These tend to be very effective tools, but they're quite blunt tools for the reasons I suggested at the start. They tend to be used almost as a substitute for design rather than for encouraging a creative site-based or place-based design process. We rely on them sometimes too heavily. So let's come to the informal tools. And these are the sorts of tools that this organization that I mentioned, the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, was very engaged with for 10 years. And they used a whole series of tools in these different categories. And I would say very successfully actually used these tools. But they were, why they were so interesting is because it was a great experiment. It lasted for 10 years and we can still feel their impact now back home in the UK. These types of tools are usually considered to be very good for very complex policy problems. Problems like climate change, or how do we do with the growing problem of obesity? Difficult, complex, wicked problems are often well approached by these types of tools, which are good at persuading, cajoling, influencing decision-making of a whole range of different actors. They're not about saying you must do this or you must do that. They're about persuasion. So they're using these soft powers of the state 
in a more informal way. So these start with what I would call evidence. And here it's things like research uh, or audit works where you're auditing what is the quality of the built environment, understanding what we have, or research around a particular problem, how a particular process works, how a particular type of building, why it's always, you know, why, for, uh, for example, the quality of housing in London isn't as good as we would like it to be. You might launch a research project around that. And it's about getting a better understanding and monitoring what we already have. Just finished a huge audit of the whole of England looking at housing developments. We looked at 150 schemes or so, and we're publishing that. That's an audit to understand where we are now, what sort of quality are we producing. So there's those two types of evidence. Then we have what we might call knowledge tools. And these are tools for spreading wisdom. That wisdom might have been gained through the research or the audit work, or it might have just been gained through getting people in a room like this and, and, uh, and talking to professionals and saying, you know, well, what's the problems that you're facing? And, and, and then maybe writing a guide, some sort of practice guide, or publishing case studies of, of good practice or poor practice or putting on education and training programs. And CABE was very good at all these things. For example, they had a great website with lots of case studies, both from the UK and around Europe, pointing to particular exemplars that local authorities could, could aspire to achieve. So used well, these type of knowledge tools can be quite powerful. Then tools we might call promotion tools. These are tools which are a bit more interventionist in, in that you're proactively making an argument for a particular type of outcome. Rather than just putting the information out there in a guide or something or a case study that people can or cannot use, this is more proactive. Uh, things like awards, active campaigns around particular issues. We've had a very long-standing campaign throughout the UK, for example, that people should pick rubbish up and put it in a bin rather than just throwing it on the floor. And this campaign has been going for decades. And that's a campaign, and it's, it's, it's reasonably effective. And we can use campaigns around design. CABE did a lot of campaigning uh, around wasted space and, 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 and all sorts of different aspects. We, direct advocacy we can use. A lot of advocacy, CABE went to speak to lots of government departments and lots of local authorities and to try and get them to change their practices. Or forming partnerships between organisations. In England, we have a problem that highways authorities don't talk to planning authorities. And therefore, where they do, where there's a partnership between the two, we tend to get much better quality places. So partnerships fit there as well. Then a set of tools, the fourth set of tools we might call evaluation. This is where experts make judgments about actual projects. Uh, so yesterday we were hearing about the DQI, the design quality indicator. That's a type of indicator where you can use that structure, that framework to evaluate a particular project and make a judgment about whether it's going to be good or bad. Design review processes, where there's a jury making a decision, making a, having a discussion about a project and making recommendations, which then are then taken on board. Different types of certification. You can say, this building meets this standard, and therefore we're going to give it a certificate to say it's a very sustainable building or something else. It's a very accessible building. And competitions. I hear you use those a lot here in Geneva, and a lot of... Cities do use co competitions back home in the UK. We hardly ever use competitions. We should use them much more. All of these are essentially means of getting experts to make judgments about particular schemes or particular places. And they tend to be very effective. And then the final tool is what we could call assistance. And this is where the state engages more directly in the process of design so rather than just having a group of people who are saying, this is, you know, your scheme is good or bad, go away and get do better, or yes, it's fine, we would recommend it gets permission. Here, 
the state engages more directly in the process, either through financial assistance, um, for example, CABE used to fund local authorities to get their own design review panels. CABE did design review nationally, but they also funded local design review processes as well. Or enabling where you say, right, well, this local authority's got this amazing project which they need to deliver, but they don't have the skills in-house to do it. So we, as the government, will lend you three urban designers for two years, and they will enable you to shape this important project at this particular time, and then that resource will disappear. So that's what we mean by enabling. It's more direct assistance within a particular process of design or development. So in the UK, we have used all of these different types of tools, and uh, they relate together very well. And when we, th when at the end of our piece of research looking at K, what we found is that those responsible for these types of tools should fully embrace both the informal as well as the formal tools. The informal tools are incredibly powerful at shaping this decision-making environment over time. So they don't lead to immediate change. They don't necessarily even relate to particular projects or places, but they help to shape an environment where better decisions will eventually be made around design and place quality. So that those responsible should fully embrace informal as well as formal tools of urban design governments and should consider such process, processes to be part of a long-term and necessary societal investment in place. That was the lesson from CABE. Our government at the time immediately forgot that and got rid of CABE in their great wisdom. We also found that the informal tools are particularly vital for shaping, as I say, that all-important decision-making environment within which those place-specific design decisions occur. And now I'm part of a project called Urban Maestro, and you can look at uh, the project website here, and there's other colleagues in the room. And we, uh, UCL, are working with uh, UN Habitat and uh, the Brussels Baumeister to deliver this project. And this project is looking across Europe at these informal tools of urban design governance and how different countries are have different tools. The first part of the project has been about understanding what everybody is doing, what everybody has, and we're just, I think, about nine months into the project. Uh, and so we've been conducting a survey across Europe, and over the next 15 months or so, we'll be doing a series of workshops around Europe, getting people together to discuss the use of these informal tools and the soft powers of the state around the governance of design. So do have a look at our website. We've got our first, well, our second workshop in Porto in January. But one of the immediate things that occurred to us, we've been debating this structure because those two triangles related to the British experience of, of the types of tools. And we've been debating, uh, is that the right structure for when we, when we look across Europe? And one of the immediate things that occurred to us is there's a, there's a category of tools that CABE wasn't using, which we might call design exploration, which is another form of soft governance power. It's the closest you can get to development without actually developing something. And it's these types of tools research by design, design-led community participation, on-site experimentation. So experimenting with design alternatives or getting people engaged in those processes of design. So temporary schemes which are put in place to test out whether something might be viable or there might be a better long-term solution for a place. So about engaging people and testing out ideas. And that, this state 
clearly has an important role in that regard as well. And we can broadly say that's a type of informal design government. Back in old England, um, since the demise of CABE in 2011, I've been running a, a thing called the Place Alliance. It's really a network called the Place Alliance. And what the Place Alliance was set up was to help try and fill the leadership gap left by the absence of the state from these issues of design. The state in 2011 said, we're just focusing on austerity. We're not interested in design and the quality of the built environment. We haven't got time to worry about that stuff. So we're going to forget about it. And there was a big gap. There was a big leadership gap. So Place Alliance was one of a number of initiatives that tried to help fill that gap. And Place Alliance has really been focused on those top three informal categories of tools. Because Place Alliance is run from University College London, run without any resources. Uh, we don't have any resources from the state. Nobody's given us any money. A lot of it is about volunteers engaging with this process. So we use evidence, we use knowledge, and we use promotion to try and help fill some of this leadership gap. And what I'm going to talk to you about now for the rest of my time is one of those initiatives, which is one of those particular tools which probably fits into the evidence category, because as a university, we're very interested in evidence, research evidence. But we use it across the other categories of informal design governance as well. And here, I'm going to talk to you about a wiki that we produce called Place Value Wiki, and a related piece of guidance. And this, the origin of this was that planners and politicians, local politicians, and communities were telling us, were telling Place Alliance, that they didn't have, they no longer had the evidence that they needed to make the case locally for a high quality of design. That the government had withdrawn, and a lot of the evidence that CABE had put together was no longer very available. So they needed new forms of evidence that they could say to developers, they could say to planning authorities, design is really important for these reasons, and therefore we need to, we need to prioritize it. So this tool was about helping them to make those arguments for design quality. So as we know, urban places come in all sorts of different varieties, great variety and richness, and our individual experience of those places, of course, varies depending on who we are, where we live, the nature of our lifestyles, whether we live in places of prosperity or places of poverty, of course, impacts on our experience of place. But fundamentally, the quality of place impacts on a whole variety of different concerns. It impacts on our health and well-being. It impacts on economic, social, and cultural opportunities available to us. It impacts on our togetherness and our empowerment as communities, as citizens. It impacts on real estate markets, on things like emissions, carbon emissions, on pollution. And all of this is or should be profoundly political. Often it isn't, because we're worrying about other stuff, like Brexit or stuff like that. Uh, and, but it should be profoundly political. And all of these arguments means that place quality adds value. The quality of the place adds value. And you don't have to believe me. I'm already convinced about that. It's not just a woolly assertion that I'm making. This is embedded in a whole series of facts. It is a fact that place quality adds value. And Place Value Wiki was an attempt to try and put the evidence together to back up these arguments. So what we did is we started by doing a very large search for evidence, empirical evidence. We started off with a lot of 
uh, different records just through online searches. And we narrowed that down and narrowed it down till we had just 300 of what we thought were the most robust empirical pieces of evidence, research evidence, that link different aspects of quality to if different aspects of value. And sometimes those are quite minute aspects of quality. Things like, what is the value of a tree in the street to the property? What impact does it have on the property? Or what impact does it have on the number of people walking up and down the street? There's lots of bits of research which look at quite minute aspects of design and relate those to other often quite minute aspects of value. The wiki, place value wiki, takes a different view of value to what we commonly hear about. We commonly hear about value as being price, and that's just one way of looking at the value of a place. What we did is we decided that the value was, the place value was the degree to which different qualities of the built environment impact either positively or negatively on different policy priorities. What do I mean by that? Well, most societies are worried about these sorts of things. They spend a lot of time debating issues around society and health and the economy and the environment. I've lost a T from my environment. Um, and these are the big ticket policy issues. These are the issues on which elections are won and lost. So we have to put our arguments about place quality in the, that context for our arguments to be heard. What is place quality in this sense? Well, it's that which returns the greatest value to its users. So a place is of high quality if it impacts in a, pol in a positive way on those different big ticket policy priorities, those big ticket policy issues. So if a place allows us to lead healthy, socially rich, in economically productive lifestyles, lifestyles which touch lightly on the built environment. If a place allows us to do those things, then the place is of high quality. If it doesn't, then we could say it's not a high quality place because it's not giving us that those different forms of value that we would expect. The wiki classifies all this evidence, these 300 or so studies, under different categories against these four big policy priorities. I haven't got time to talk about all these. Uh, if you're interested, then do look at the wiki because under each of these, there's a whole set of conclusions about the types of value that are returned. Just to give you a few examples, so, for example, there's a lot of evidence, we heard about some yesterday, that links better mental health to the quality of the built environment, to different aspects of the quality of the built environment. Less stress, more psychological restfulness, reduced depression, and so forth. Equally, there's a lot of evidence that relates different aspects of the quality of the built environment to crime rates, and better quality built environments reduce crime, reduce burglary from homes, lower street crime, and so forth. Equally, there's a lot of evidence that, that links quality to property values in different ways. So there's a lot of evidence which li uh, li uh, links office sector, uplifting the value of offices uh, and reduced vacancy and depreciation to, to a better quality built environment. And there's a lot of evidence that links reduced energy use and associated carbon emissions to different aspects of quality. And if you're really interested, you can download this fascinating paper, Place Value, Place Quality, and its Impact on Health, Social, Economic, and Environmental Outcome. Underpinning this is this basic idea and I think this relates to the discussions we were having yesterday about what is the nature of a quality place. The idea is that there's a virtuous loop. Place quality delivers place value. So place quality delivers that value under all of those four big 
policy priorities. And we can use that value to define place quality. So places that are delivering on that value are high quality places. And that's a simple way of thinking about what is a quality place or not. So, what does all this say about the sorts of places that we should be building? Well, what it says is we shouldn't be building this sort of place. Suburban, no greenery, disconnected from the city. We shouldn't be building this sort of place, car-dominated environment. What we should be building is this sort of place, mixed, green, connected streets, places for play, more vibrant, maybe medium density. These sorts of places seem to be fundamentally good for us, for our health, for society, for the economy, and for the environment. And what we did is once we'd produced the wiki, we thought, well, let's put that in a form that will be useful for those professionals and local politicians to argue the case, to make the case locally. So we produced this ladder of place quality. And what this defines is what are the qualities that we should avoid at the bottom of the ladder and at the top, what sort of qualities should we require? So right at the bottom on the avoid category, there's a lot of strong evidence for the sorts of qualities in this category that we should, that these lead to bad outcomes for human beings. These sorts of qualities, car dependent, extensive suburbanization, absence of local green space, uh, poor maintenance and dilapidation, a sense of overcrowding, more than density, it's the sense of overcrowding, presence of too many fast food stores. These sorts of things we know are bad for us. There's a huge amount of empirical evidence on all of these. We should avoid them. Then there's a set of qualities around which we need to be careful because whilst there is research evidence, sometimes it points in different directions or it's just not completely clear yet which way we need to point. So we need to be careful about being too prescriptive in some areas. We need to think carefully about these sorts of things. Prescribing particular architectural styles, for example, we should be careful about. Higher versus lower density development. There's different evidence that points in different directions on the whole question of density, although broadly I'd say medium density development seem to be pretty good for us. There's different evidence around high-rise living, for example. It seems to be okay for some groups in society, not so good for others, families and so forth. So we need to be careful about some issues in design. Then there's a set of qualities around which there is good evidence of positive outcomes. We can be reasonably confident in these areas. We should aspire to these sorts of qualities. Often they tend to be the sorts of issues that are slightly more intangible. So there's not a huge amount of evidence, but there is some evidence. Things like visual permeability, sense of place, facade continuity, and so forth. And then finally, at the top of the ladder, there are those qualities around which there is so much definitive evidence that we should absolutely require these qualities in all new development. And these are things like greenness, a mix of uses, low levels of traffic within developments, walkability, compact and coherent patterns of development, bikeability, public transport connectivity. Now, there's nothing new here. We all know this stuff already. But what this does is it tries to give politicians and professionals a tool which they can slam down on somebody's desk and say, here's the evidence, we need to take it seriously. And we can put this all together in a ladder of place quality. So just to draw this to some conclusion, what the evidence says is very clear. 99% of the evidence points broadly in the same direction. 
that better quality places add value economically, socially, environmentally, and in terms of health outcomes. It's really very, very clear. But it's not always simple, of course, because sometimes those benefits don't always flow to those who paid for the things in the first place. Sometimes things flow over longer periods of time. My example of the street tree, the tree in the street, that takes a long time to grow. The real benefits are not the developer who builds the place in the first place isn't going to get the benefit, perhaps even the person who lives there in the first few years. But the people who live there five, ten years will get the benefits of those street trees. So sometimes these things take a little while to work through the system. But it is an absolute necessity of life, the quality of place, so important to our basic well-being that it should be the expectations of all, no matter who we are in society, whichever strata of society we come from, we should have an expectation that we, live in, that we can live in a good quality place. This is something that our government at home forgot for quite a few years and are remembering now, uh, which is good. And sometimes governments, wherever they are, need to be reminded of this stuff. So, coming back to Place Alliance, what this tool did, this tool was really a piece of evidence. The wiki was a piece of evidence, as, and we're using it in other tools, the, the audit, this housing audit over the whole country that I explained, we're using it in that as well. But we then, on the back of that, produced our ladder. We're using it in training as well. So we're using it in not, in not, as a knowledge tool as well. And we're using it for campaigning and advocacy. So we're using it as a promotional tool. So you can develop one tool and you can use it in different ways across different categories and so forth. So, read the report, climb the ladder, wherever you are, wherever you come from. Thank you very much.